not quite. Sometimes you, maybe you had the experience, you know, sometimes you, you, there's somebody always just better than you. They always do just better than you in everything. They get better marks in the exams, and they do better in the sports, and, you know, everything they do just a bit better than you. So, Lord Krishna was like that. He was always better than Sishupal. Sishupal was naturally very envious of Krishna, and he criticized Krishna a lot. So it happened, Sishupal was supposed to marry Rukmini. Marriage was um, arranged by, who arranged the marriage? Rukmini, the brother of Rukmini, not the father. Father was Bishmaka. He actually understood Rukmini should be married to Krishna. But Rukmini was very powerful. He didn't listen to the father. He arranged the marriage to his friend, Sishupal. So Rukmini didn't get much say in the matter. It's a young girl. Right? She was quite young at the time of the marriage. So she just had to do what she was told. Right? Yeah. <laughs> there was no women's liberation in those days. <laughs> There was no women independent. Everyone was under the control. Prabhupada says, young girl should be taken care by the father, but then she gets married, husband will take care, and then an old age son should take care. What happens if you have no son? Krishna. Huh? Krishna, Krishna yeah. Just like Lord Krishna killed Kams. When he killed Kams, Kams' wives were widows. They had no children. They went back to their father. Who would, you know who the fa father of Kams' wives was? Jarasan. right? Jarasan. So Jarasan made war on Krishna. That I'll get this Krishna. He's killed comes. So he come Jarasandha attacked Mathura seventeen times. And every time Krishna would defeat the whole army. And there'd only be Jarasandha left. They he'd go back. They wouldn't he wouldn't kill Jarasandha. Jarasandha would go back. And the, the, the other Kshatriyas would say, oh, you were just unlucky. Try again. Next time you'll defeat him. So one time after another, all the way up, 17 times, Charasanda would come each time with an army and try to fight Lord Krishna. And he could never defeat him. Then the 18th time was a little different. What happened was another king was coming, someone called Kalayavana. He was also coming with a big army to attack Mathura. So that was when Lord Krishna decided he would move all the people in Mathura, move them all to Dwarka. Did you ever go to Dwarka? Been to Dwarka? Yes. Quite far, quite remote place, you know, way, way over on the end of Saurashtra. So, Lord Krishna moved everyone all the way over to Dwarka. And there was a reason for that, because he didn't want all these people coming to Mathura. He didn't want anybody in Mathura to be harmed. And he also wanted to take the attention away from Vrindavan because his dear devotees were all in Vrindavan and he didn't want any demons, any more demons coming there to Vrindavan. 
troubling all his Greek devotees. So he moved everyone to Dwarka. So when he was in Dwarka, that was when Rukmini's marriage was being arranged. And Rukmini had been hearing about Lord Krishna. How did she hear? Did she read the newspaper? Was it on the internet? How did she hear about Krishna? Hmm? A, a Brahman? Visiting visit from visitors also. Yeah, who was the visitors? Narad, Narad right. Narad, Narad was come and tell, tell her about Lord Krishna. She would hear about Krishna and she would become attracted. This was quite a common thing. It's like young women hear about some man, they become interested. So Rukmini became attracted to, to Lord Krishna and she resolved he was the only man who would be her husband. She didn't want any other man for a husband. And so she wrote a letter and sent it with the Brahmana. She had a Brahmana there and she sent the Brahmana to Dwarka to deliver her letter to Lord Krishna. Rukmini is a, an example of a devotee who is fully surrendered to Krishna. Do you know there are nine different ways in which we practice bhakti yoga, right? Yes. Shravanam, Kirtan, Smaranam, Pavasevanam, Archanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmani Vedanam. Yeah, you missed Vandanam. Vandanam, yes. Yeah. And then Atmani Vedana, right? So who is our example? Who does? In each one, there's one person who does these different processes, who achieves perfection, just like Sukadev Goswami chanted Srimad Bhagavatam and achieved perfection. And Maharaj Parikshit heard, right? And who remembered? Prahlad Maharaj. Remember. And who offered prayers? Akrura. Akrura, right. And who is Archanam? Prithu Maharaj. Prithu Maharaj. And then Padasevanam? Lakshmi. Lakshmi. And Dashyam? Hanuman. And Sakyam? Arjuna. And Atmani Vedanam? Bali Maharaj. Yes, Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj surrendered everything to Lord Vamanade. But Rukmini also is an example of Atmani Vedana. She also surrendered, she surrendered everything. She's ready to give up her life for Lord Krishna. She, she has that mood of surrender. She would just give everything for Lord Krishna. She fully surrendered to Krishna. She, 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 did her, she said, my life has no meaning without Krishna. So she wrote the letter to the Brahmana and the Brahmana went from the place of, what's that place where Rukmini is from? You know, I, I can't. Vidarbha. Vidarbha. Uh, Vidarbha. Vidarbha. Yeah. Vidarbha. So he, she went, he went to Dwarka. And Lord, he gets into Dwarka because Lord Krishna likes to see the Brahmanas. Not everyone would get into Dwarka, but the Brahmanas, they're very dear to Krishna, right? Krishna likes the cows and the Brahmanas. We don't see a lot of cows in Dwarka, but Krishna liked the cows. But when I went to Dwarka anyway, you don't see too many cows. Huh? Did you see a lot of cows there? No. Not really, yeah. So anyway, the Brahmana got in to see Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna meets the Brahmana and he asks the Brahmana, how are you, my dear Brahmana? Are you meeting, are you following the religious principles? Are you 
satisfied. This is an, an, an important principle of a brahmana, that they should be satisfied. They may be wealthy or they may be poor. Whatever condition they're in, they will be satisfied. It's very important to cultivate the mode of goodness. Right? There are three modes. Goodness, passion and ignorance. We always hear about Rajagun and Tamagun. Yeah? People think Rajagun, that's really good. They think that's the excitement, that's the pleasure. They don't know that Rajagun means distress. You're going to get distress. That's the result of Rajagun, that you come to distress. So, Lord Krishna was concerned that Brahmana should be peaceful. It should be in the mode of goodness. Brahmana is a symbol of the mode of goodness. So those of you who are in Brahminical families, you want to be peaceful, you want to be satisfied. You don't want to be always greedy for more. Oh, we don't have enough. You know, always complaining. Why? You know, <laughs> we want to be satisfied by the grace of Krishna. And you see nice examples like who was Lord Krishna's Brahmana friend? Sudama. Sudama, right? Sudama. How? He was so poor, but he was so happy. He was satisfied. He didn't, he didn't want, well, Lord Krishna has another Brahmana friend in Vrindavan. Madhu Mangal. You know him? Everybody's laughing. <laughs> yeah, Madhu Mangal, his dear Brahmana friend. In Vrindavan. So Sudama had come there to Dwarka and Rukmini had sent the Brahmana there and Lord Krishna was examining the Brahmana that are you satisfied? Are you peaceful? How to be satisfied? How to be peaceful? You have to cultivate Krishna consciousness. You have to chant the Maha Mantra. You have to read the scriptures. We have to remind ourselves about the goal of life. The goal of life is not to become rich and to have opulence, but the goal of life is to become Krishna conscious, to become a dear devotee of Lord Krishna. Any other opulence will be very temporary. It won't last for long. So we have to understand the real value of life. Then we will be peaceful, we'll be happy if we cultivate consciousness of Krishna. But if we forget Krishna, then we will simply think about in trying to enjoy this material world and we'll be in anxiety. There will be all the time problems and stress. So many undesirable things will result of forgetting Krishna. So Lord Krishna got the message from the Brahman. Brahmana and he read it and he understood everything. Of course, Lord Krishna knows everything. He knows past, present and future. So when the letter came, it was not a surprise to him. And he, in the letter, Rukmini had also told him, she was telling Lord Krishna how he could come there at the time of her marriage 
and how he could take her before her marriage. And so Lord Krishna agreed, oh, okay, we will go there. And he arranged, get my chariot ready. Who's Lord Krishna's chariot driver? Garuka. Yes, Garuka. Get my chariot ready. And Lord Krishna got on the chariot. The Brahmana also got on the chariot with Krishna and they went off to Vidarbha. There's Videhi and Vidarbha, right? <laughs> one is the place of Sita, isn't it? And one is for Rukmini. So Vidarbha, Vidarbi. Sometimes Rukmini is called Vidarbi. She's the daughter of the king of Vidarbha. The father's name was? Bishmaka. 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 Yes, Bishmaka. So Rukmini is from a royal family, Maharaj Bishmaka. But he had his sons, several, I think five sons. Mm. So Ruk Rukma. Was a very envious person, Rukmi. There was Rukma, Rukmi. Anyway, uh, Lord Krishna had he brought the Brahmana there. They came to the place where the marriage was to take place, and all the Kshatriyas had all come there. Maharaj, all the different Maharajis, Jarasandha, all the friends of Sishupal. They're all the enemies of Lord Krishna. And they'd all come there and they said, we're going to make sure this marriage takes place. If Krishna comes here, we're not going to let him interfere in this marriage. And they were thinking they were going to oppose Lord Krishna. But Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord. And by his arrangement, he came there and it, it came at the time when Ruk, Rukmini was going to the temple of Ambika, is it Ambika or Durga? Ambika, Ambika yeah. He, she was going to the temple part before the wedding, get the blessings from Ambika. And she was coming out from the temple and Lord Krishna is there. And he just picks her up and puts her on his chariot and drove <laughs> off. He drove off with her. And everyone, you know, they were like astounded. They were just so shocked. Lord Krishna does these things and it took some time before they could realize what had happened. And so they set off in pursuit of Lord Krishna. But Lord Balaram had also heard that Lord Krishna was going there. So Lord Balaram also came with an army. And when all these different Kshatriyas came after them, Lord Balaram came with his army and he checked them, he stopped them. They could not do anything. However, Rukmini's brother, Rukmi, was very angry. He could not. He, it was just unbearable to him that this had happened because he had promised Sishupal that you will marry my sister. And so Sishupal was thinking, oh, very good, I'm getting such a nice wife, the desirable woman for everyone. All the kings wanted her. And Rukmi said, I'm giving her to you, Sishupal. So Sishupal was thinking he's going to marry Rukmini. But then at the last minute, the whole thing changed. He <laughs> lost her. So it was devastating. Sishupal was heartbroken. You could imagine he'd already given his heart to this woman. <laughs> And then at the last minute, taken away. <laughs> <laughs> Must 
very painful. You women are laughing, but... <laughs> the man, the Sishupa was not laughing. It was very heartbreaking. His heart was broken in many pieces. Mm. So, uh, anyway, Rukmi, I'm going to get Krishna, I'm going to kill him. It said, Krishna, I'm going to kill him. And he went after, he said, and he said, if I can't kill him, I will never come back here. And Rukmi went after Krishna. And he went after Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna saw Rukmi's coming. And so Lord Krishna turns to fight with him. And of course, Lord Krishna overwhelms Rukmi. He takes him a prisoner. And Rukmini saw that Lord Krishna has got his sword and he could kill him at any moment. So she begs him, Oh, please, he's my brother. Oh, please, don't, don't kill my brother. So Rukmini begged Lord Krishna that, Please spare my brother. So Krishna thought, Hmm, okay. And he took his sword and he began to cut bits of hair off his head, different patches. So that was, that was like death because he's a Kshatriya. And the Kshatriyas, they, don't, they didn't cut their hair. They had long hair, like the Sikhs, right? Like that. Sikhs are supposed to be Kshatriyas. Sikhs are supposed to protect the Hindus. So they were the Kshatriyas. So Krishna just cut bits of hair off different places, made them look very funny. At that time, Lord Balaram came there. Lord Balaram came and saw the situation and said, said to Lord Krishna, Oh, Krishna, how you could do this to your relative? <laughs> he is your brother-in-law. It's not a very nice way to treat your brother-in-law. Balaram said like that to Krishna. Lord Balaram sometimes is a guru of Krishna. Lord Balaram's is uh, Dauji, right? Dauji, the big brother. Krishna's Kana, Krishna Kanaya, Dauji Kabaya. <laughs> so, Lord Balaram, he can do that because he's the big brother. He can tell Krishna. And later, so Lord Krishna took Rukmini back to Dwarka and they had a marriage. And then, of course, Lord Krishna married other queens. But Rukmini was the first queen and she was the most favorite wife of Lord Krishna. And Narada Muni would go there to Dwarka and he would see how Lord Krishna was living with all of his queens. But Rukmini was a very special wife of Lord Krishna. The two, there are two wives. If you go to the temple in Dwarka, Dwarkadish temple, you see there are two queens there. One is Satyabhama and the other is Rukmini. There are actually eight principal queens of Krishna. And then later on the 16,100 other queens came. But initially the different eight queens which were all married by Lord Krishna. Rukmini was the first one. Then Sat Sat well, Jambavati, Satyabhama, and then there was Lakshmana, there was uh, Kalindi and Bhadra and uh, uh, well, anyway, like there were eight principal queens. And then this way Lord Krishna established Dwarka. And by each queen he had ten sons and one daughter. Mm. <laughs> so in this way Dwarka became very full of people, so many people, 
so many brahmanas, so many pandits, so many activities, even said even there were prostitute ladies there in Dwarka, Srimad Bhagavatam describes. So it was a whole metropolis developed in the time of Lord Krishna. But then time came for Lord Krishna to finish his pastimes. And at that time Dwarka all returned to went back into the sea. And Lord Krishna departed from the world and the, the different queens, they also went back to the, to the spiritual realm. So Lord Krishna enjoys, he has a different consorts. In Vrindavan, he was with the gopis. In Dwarka, he has his queens. And in the spiritual world, there are Lakshmis, the goddesses of fortune. And they're all there in the mood of servants to Krishna. Their mood is to be the servant. And devotees, we also cultivate that mood of being the servant. We say, Gopi Bhartu Padakamalaya or Dasa Das Anu Dasa. That the mood of the devotee, he doesn't think, we don't think, I am sannyasi or Vanaprastha or Grihastha or Brahmachari. We don't think I'm Brahman or Kshatriya or Vaishya or Sudra, but we simply think I am a servant of the servant of the servant, many times the servant of Krishna. That should be our thinking, to be the servant. Lord Krishna is the master and we are all servants. We're not women, we're not men, we're all servants. We're the prakriti of Krishna. Krishna is the purush. There's only one purush, Krishna. All others we are all prakriti, we are the energy of Lord Krishna. So we are meant to serve Krishna. And how can we serve Krishna? How, how, what do we have to give Krishna in service? Lord Krishna has so many servants there, in this, there are so many goddesses of fortune, he has so many queens, there are so many gopis, how could we ever serve Krishna? What service can we do for Krishna? Well, we can chant his name. That is very important. The chanting of the names of the name of Lord Krishna. To chant the Maha Mantra. Very important. Lord Krishna says, Naham Tishtani Vaikunte. Yes, I'm not in the Vaikuntha and I'm not in the hearts of the yogis. Where is Krishna? Wherever the devotee is chanting the names of the Lord. Lord Krishna is attracted by devotees who chant his name. If we call to Krishna, Krishna can come. But we have to call with love. We have to call purely, just like your child, your children, when they cry, they want you, right? They want the mother. Like when the mother comes, then they... See? <laughs> Children's crying, they want attention. Who do they want attention from? Mother. Mother has to go take care. Lord Krishna, when we chant, Prabhupada said we should chant like a child separated from the mother. Like that, we call to Krishna. Oh Krishna, please pick me up. Please save me from this material world. This world of birth and death. This world of samsara. 
So Lord Krishna, he will be attracted by only one thing attracts Krishna, that is devotion. No other thing can attract him. You cannot bribe him, right? <laughs> Lord Krishna is captured by devotion. It is bhakti. Not jnana, not karma, but bhakti. Bhakti is at the, the top of the yoga ladder. Are you studying the Bhagavad Gita? Have you studied Bhagavad Gita? Yes? Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Wait, have you taken the classes on Bhagavad Have you done the course on Bhagavad Gita? Yes, Mother. Yes? You did Bhakti Shastri? Yes, Mother. How many? You three? Yes. Yeah. Any other ladies did Bhakti Shastri? Mataji, yeah, yeah. You did Bhakti Shastri? Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, we have, we have these courses, you know, we try to uh, share the knowledge, but particularly Bhagavad Gita. During the COVID time, the Bangalore devotees developed a very nice uh, seminar on Bhagavad Gita, and it was a chapter a day, one hour a day, one chapter a day, and you could do the, you know, and in this way we got thousands of people all studying the Bhagavad Gita. They would come and one hour online, they'd take, and they would hear the class on the Bhagavad Gita. And we do it in different languages as well, all different languages. But it's very helpful for people to get an overview of the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, we, it, the, the Bangalore devotees developed it into different levels. And the idea is that they will also come to take the Bhakti Shastri course. The Bhakti Shastri course brings people into the, um, um, a systematic study of the scriptures. We begin with the Bhagavad Gita and we have also other books like the Ishopanishad and the Upadeshamrita and then the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, right? The first part. We just study the first part for Bhakti Shastri. But the Bhakti Shastri course helps to give a very good foundation of spiritual knowledge. And, and you can go on to other levels also. And some devotees, even some, some teachers like Jaipataka Swami Maharaj, he requests the devotees that before you, want, before you take the, the second initiation, first of all, complete the Bhakti Shastri course. It doesn't take very long. We have other courses. We have a thing called the Disciple Course, ISKCON Disciple Course. If you're thinking about maybe one day you may want to get initiation. So there's a course which, uh, which people have to, it's a short course. It's just few hours, one, yeah. One, one day, one day. Huh? One day. One day, mm -hmm. one day, can be one day. Sometimes they would do it every evening for a week. Mm -hmm. We do it every evening for a week. It depends how they present it, you know. But we do it also in different languages. It's done from Vrindavan, it's done from Mayapur, it's done online. Even locally it can be done here. Somebody here in Dubai can present the course. But it's very nice to learn about the society. If you're thinking of becoming a devotee and becoming more interested in practicing Krishna consciousness, then you, need to, you should know about the society, how it's set up and how it's managed, how it's organized. And you should know also what is the procedure for initiation. If you wanted to get initiation, how do you do it? What happens? You know, do you just look at the pictures and then pick out one person? I think he looks nice. Can he be, I don't know, write to him and ask him to give me initiation. Yeah. 
No, we learn what is the proper procedure, how to do it, how to identify a spiritual teacher, what are you looking for, and what should be there, what's the qualification of the teacher, what's the qualification of the student. These kind of things are taught in the course. So it's, it's, it's useful information to have. Because a lot of people don't know these things. They say, I have a guru. And they say, oh yeah, our, all from our family, our family, we're all initiated. It's our guru. You know, that's not exactly how it's supposed to be. And guru means one who can give knowledge, destroy ignorance. And initiation, diksha, diksha means the process by which you get spiritual knowledge and you destroy sins, destroy sinful reactions. Did you do, ever do any sins? <laughs> Maybe in the last life, right? <laughs> yeah. So, Diksha helps us to destroy these things, you see, and to give us knowledge. So, it's very valuable. So, we should know the, the process. And it's not immediately, it's not that the Diksha is just, you know, one thing, one day they do the Diksha and you get all the knowledge and all your sins are destroyed, it takes time, it takes some time, you see. But there's a beginning. So you can learn all of these different things in the disciple course. And it's very interactive as well. It's, a, you know, a lot of questions and answers. And that's encouraged, that there should be the interaction. So, these, these courses are there, it's very good, you know, all of you, we encourage you, take these courses, like the disciple course, I'd, be, I'd been teaching it, I, I taught it many times, <laughs> in the beginning there was nobody to teach it, so I had to teach it, you know, I, so I ended up teaching it so many times, and I found the more I taught it, the more I appreciated how much is there, how much is being taught in it. So like Bhagavad Gita, you read the Bhagavad Gita, you read it one time, you don't know every, you read it again, you get a bit more. You read it another time, more. And every time you read it, you get more and more. It opens up. It's like the ocean. You go bathing in the sea, you know a little bit about the sea. You don't know everything about the sea. So Bhagavad Gita is like that. It's so deep, it's so vast. But we, we need to enter into these things and try to understand them. It's for our purification. We get purification by contact with Krishna and Krishna conscious activities. And with purification, we all feel happier, we'll feel relaxed, we'll feel free of the burden of all the pressures and anxieties which are there in the material world. So this is given to us by Lord Krishna. So we want all of you ladies kindly take advantage of these things. So many of you are here. You can bring your husbands also. <laughs> Sometimes, often husband and wife will come together. Not every time. Sometimes the husband comes first and the wife comes later. More common, women come first. <laughs> and the men come a bit later. But often they come together. Husband wants to, I want to see what my wife's invo getting involved in, you know. <laughs> so that's good, they're caring. So we welcome them, come and hear. All right, any question? Anyone?
Yes, very good. Good question. Why do we need initiation? Yes, if you're just going to chant, you don't need initiation. Just chant. But you're not just going to chant. You're going to do a lot of other things besides chant. Just like we worship deities, worship Krishna, right? You're going to worship Krishna. Lord Krishna had a guru, you know? Lord Krishna had a guru. Sandipani Muni. Yeah, if you go to Ujjain, Ujjain used to be called Avanti, Avantipur. You can see Sandipani Muni's ashram there. Lord Krishna went there. And even at his birth, Gargacharya came, did the name giving ceremony for Krishna and Balaram. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also took initiation. He went to Gaya. He was initiated. Srila Prabhupada took initiation. Prabhupada met his guru in Al Prayagraj, today Prayagraj, Allahabad. So, you don't need a guru? <laughs> no, no, it's good. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you have Shiksha Guru, right. Yes, that's the first thing. First you should have Shiksha. And Shiksha Gurus you can have many, not just one. You can have several Shiksha Gurus, right? So Shiksha Gurus, they're giving you instructions. And after some time, from the different Shiksha Gurus, one will become more prominent. And that person should become your Diksha Guru, who gives you the initiation. Because initiation is part of the process of Bhakti Yoga. It's part of the process that taking, taking instruction and then taking initiation and serving. So Prabhupada is a Shiksha Guru for everyone. He is the founder, Acharya. This is, this is explained in very much detail in the Disciple Course. If you attend the ISKCON Disciple Course, they will explain there about why we have to have initiation. But, you see, if you're just going to chant Hare Krishna, that's all you, you don't need initiation. It's stated even in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Right? Have you read Chaitanya Charitamrita? Okay, so Madhya Lila, uh, chapter 18, verse 108. It says, you don't need initiation to just chant Hare Krishna. But, you're not going to just chant Hare Krishna. You're going to have questions. When you're, and you, you want to know how to improve your chanting. You want to know how to chant in a manner in which you can get perfection. You have to have teacher, you have to have association for these things. You have to have people explaining to you and helping you to improve your chanting and to develop your love for Krishna. So the initiation helps us. The initiation process helps to bring us closer to Krishna. Lord Krishna says, if someone says they are my devotee, they're not really my devotee. But if he's a devotee of my devotee, then he is my devotee. Mm -hmm. So the idea is you have to have some devotion 
not just only for Krishna, but for Krishna's devotees. Now, as you say, you have people give you shiksha. They're giving you instructions, your shiksha gurus. So from them, one of them should become more prominent, that you have particular faith and trust in them, and you want to take initiation. You should, you get, and after initiation, you still continue to take instruction from the other people also. It's not that you give up the other people and only listen to the Diksha Guru, but you can conti you can conti continue to relate with all your Shiksha Gurus and inquiring from them and hearing from them. But you should have that initiation because that initiation is the formal commitment to Bhakti. You may say. Well, I'm not initiated yet, so if I go out tonight, you know, if I go to movies tonight, you know, if I go to party tonight, I'm not initiated anyway, <laughs> right? You don't make the commitment, but once you make the commitment, then you're more serious, right? I'm initiated. I don't, I don't drink. I don't party. Mm -hmm. I'm an you want to go to Krishna, you have to go through someone. We cannot go to Krishna directly. Prahlad Maharaj was a great devotee. He did not go to Lord Nishingadev directly. Diksha Guru, those who are giving instruction. We give them the same respect. What do you say? You ready for initiation? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my husband doesn't like it. <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, you'll have to think about these things over time. You'll think about them and think about how everybody else Lord Krishna took initiation, <laughs> Lord Chaitanya, Prabhupada, you know. Are we, why shouldn't we?